you, Rabbi uh, Victor, and thank uh, all of you uh, who participated in this uh, very moving uh, ceremony. Um, we can move now to the second part uh, of, uh, of our event, uh, which also has, uh, we have established as a tradition, and, and that's a, a keynote uh, speaker. And um, Dr. Bowden, there may be perhaps students outside still waiting, so if you, you know, could you perhaps please check whether anybody is outside and let them now, uh, let them in yeah, if there are. Yes, it's, it's just as I expected, there were some people coming in. Um, <clears throat> Now, I want to start by um, thanking those who have made this, uh, who have made this event, uh, this event uh, possible. Um, before, uh, before 2008, uh, this, this event, this Holocaust commemoration was hosted by Vassar, uh, by Vassar College. When the Greenspan Trust and the Handel Family Foundation established an endowed chair in Holocaust and Genocide Studies here at the college, the Jewish Federation of Dutchess County decided to relocate the ceremony to DCC. Uh, as a result uh, of the generosity of the Handel Family Foundation and the Greenspan Trust, this event now has become a firm part uh, of DCC's calendar of events. Financial support from this endowment has made it possible to create events of high caliber like this one on a consistent basis. Uh, as a result, Holocaust education is now an established uh, part of DCC's curricular offerings for which the Handel Family Foundation and the Greenspan Trust deserve the lion's share of credit. Uh, Shirley and Bern Handel are here in the audience this evening and uh, please join me in recognizing them for their generous contributions to enrich uh, educational life at DCC. <clears throat> Um, I also want to uh, extend a couple of uh, uh, special welcomes uh, to uh, Dr. Pamela Edington, uh, president of uh, Dutchess Community College. She's here, right? Yes. Um, Howard uh, Lynn, who is the president of the Jewish Federation um, of Dutchess County. And, uh, the Jewish Federation has uh, also contributed in, 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 in helping us putting on the, the dinner that preceded this event. Uh, then June Gillespie of the June and Aaron Gillespie Forum. She lit the uh, uh, candle and, uh, for the righteous Gentiles and she uh, and the Gillespie Forum also contributed to, to, um, to, uh, to the defraying the costs of the dinner and, and we thank the forum for, uh, for that. Um, now, uh, before I start uh, introducing our guest uh, speaker, a few housekeeping items. Uh, after the lecture, uh, our speaker, Professor Diner, will be available for a book signing outside, um, just outside the doors, and there will be a reception at the, in the Ritz Lounge, just right across uh, the hallway, and I'd like to thank uh, Paula Rekas for supporting and, and sponsoring that, uh, that reception. Thank you very much, Paula. Okay. <clears throat> so now is the time, or if you haven't done so already, to mute or turn off your cell phones. Um, and it's my pleasure uh, to introduce tonight's guest, uh, Professor Hasia Diner. She is professor of Hebrew and Judaic studies and history uh, and uh, the Paul S. and Sylvia Steinberg Professor of American Jewish History at New York uh, University. She is also the director of the Goldstein Gorin Center for American uh, Jewish History. A uh, prolific author, she most recently published uh, We Remember with Reverence and Love, American Jews and the Myth of Silence After the Holocaust, 1945 to 1962. Uh, her previous work uh, had decisive influence, I think, and, and shaped the historio historiography, uh, historiography of uh, immigration uh, and social history, uh, as her book In the Almost Promised Land, American Jews and Blacks, 1915 to 1935, and uh, her book on Irish women in America, uh, Aaron da Aaron's Daughters in America, Irish Immigrant Women in the 19th Century, now uh, considered a classic in its uh, field. Uh, please uh, join me in welcoming Professor Diner to DCC.
But I want to thank um, Professor Steger and indeed uh, everybody associated with uh, this event. Uh, it's, it's really a, um, it's a kind of uh, intimidating and awesome to be speaking after a ceremony of such uh, intensity, uh, very different than my usual uh, mode of presentation, but um, I will have to proceed in my usual manner. So. Uh, in 1956, a group of Jewish teenagers who spent the summer at the Reform Movement's Camp Institute in Oconomowoc, Wisconsin, did something of absolutely no historic significance. They published a literary magazine, a typical camp annual, um, a mimeographed repository of their memories of a summer well spent. The little magazine called All Eyes uh, Are On The dot 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 literary magazine included serious and humorous pieces, short stories, poems, vignettes of camp life. Uh, some campers, however, uh, described the religious and cultural programming of that summer, the summer of 1956, at Camp Institute. One girl, 14 years old, from uh, Indiana, in her little piece uh, that got accepted into the magazine, uh, focused on the summer's theme. The theme had been Naase Venishma, we will do and we will hear, the words drawn from the biblical book of Exodus, uh, the words declaimed by the Israelites at Mount Sinai as they accepted the Ten Commandments. In her summary of what she learned that summer at camp, she revealed much about how American Jews in the post-World War II period made sense of the horrendous events which had so recently engulfed their people in Europe and how they made it an element in their American Jewish communal culture. Everywhere, this 14-year-old wrote, Jews wandered. They established centers of learning in which the deed and the word were enshrined in the life of the people. The waves of persecution beat against us, but our spirit remained unbroken. Well, that summer at Camp Institute, they had contemplated that long chain of Jewish history, and she went on to write, quote, she learned that how today in the 20th century, our people still affirm not a savage mom. During the dark reign of terror, when Hitler and the Nazis ruled Germany, they plunged the world into a catastrophic war. The people who called themselves the master race murdered six million Jews. They created the worst slaughter in the history of mankind. It's the end of the quote from uh, this young girl. She went on to retell, however, how she and her campmates had learned that even amidst the horror, quote, the light of Naaseh and Ishma burned mightily. As the world watched, a miracle came to pass. Out of the bitter struggle and against overwhelming odds, the nation of Israel was born. The words of this Jewish high school student encapsulated much about what American Jews in the post-war period said and did about the Holocaust and how they, integra how they in integrated it into their communal lives. Metaphorically, along with her, her name happened to have been Sharon Feynman, nearly all of America's Jews participated in building a culture text by text artifact by artifact and political act by political act which gave the Holocaust a prominent place. When they gathered in their Jewish spaces and when they faced the larger American public, they, made, they invoked the all too horrendous horror which had taken place in Europe. Now, they didn't necessarily use the word Holocaust to refer to that event. They employed a range of terms to connote it. She called it Hitler's dark reign of terror. Uh, others refer to Hitler times, the catastrophe with a lowercase c or with a upper, an uppercase c, or sometimes the great catastrophe, the six million, the concentration camps. All these words were, went along uh, with uh, um, others, the recent tragedy, for example. In, the public, in their publications, in the printed programs of their communal events, in the curricula of their schools, their sermons, speeches, and press releases, they employed these and other terms interchangeably. 
The program notes, for example, of a concert of Jewish music performed in, by Chicago's Halevi Society in 1953 identified on the program that the chorus would be singing uh, Yankele, a lullaby uh, written by the poet Mordechai Gebertik, uh, who had been, quote, a victim of the crematoria while the International Ladies Garment Workers Union, still a Jewish-led union, referred in its newspaper, in its Yiddish newspaper, to this event as the accursed Hitler period. A 1954 study guide published by the B'nai B'rith entitled, What Do You Know About Jewish Religion, History, Ethics, and C Culture? Uh, employed the term Hitler's ghastly program of extermination. The word Holocaust did appear in these years with or without a capital letter, and it also resonated widely. Uh, in Yiddish, as in English, no single term referred to this event. The, in, in that language, the press, the poets, the novelists, the hosts of radio shows, the orators, the survivors who spoke at events very much like this, um, the compilers of memorial books known as Yiskerbircher, uh, the pedagogical materials for Yiddish schools seized on no single word to trump all others. They invoked Hitlerzeiten, Hitler times, or probably most commonly the Chorben, the destruction. Sometimes it was the Chorben, plain and simple. Other times, uh, the Letzter Chorben, the most recent uh, destruction. Uh, the Greuser Chorben, the great destruction. Chorben Europa, the uh, destruction of Europe. And I think quite revealingly, Der Dritter Chorben, the third destruction, considering that the one brought about by the Germans to have been as cataclysmic and transformative as the destructions of the first and second temples in 586 before the Common Era and 70 in the Common, year, in, in the common Era, which had indeed uh, um, altered the essential nature of Judaism. But whatever they called it, whatever language they used, they posed the catastrophe in both deeply Jewish and broadly universal terms. The little essay by Sharon Feynman in All Eyes Are on the Literary Magazine, like the books, articles, sermons, literary works, liturgies, letters to public officials, and uh, more, blended a deeply felt anguish at what had happened uh, to the Jewish people uh, with concerns uh, for humanity uh, writ uh, large. Talk about the tragic fate of uh, the six million uh, permeated all of American Jewish life and was shared by all strands of American uh, Jewry in the post-war period. Reform, Orthodox, Reconstructionist, and conservative Jews all found ways, despite their fundamental differences about Judaism as a religious system, uh, to weave it into synagogues, uh, seminaries, uh, and uh, publications. They did so differently, but they did so nonetheless. American Zionists of every variant um, also employed the Holocaust in their organizational works, as did Jews on the left, groups like the Jewish People's Fraternal Order, closely associated with the Communist Party. The B'nai B'rit, the Jewish War Veterans, the Jewish Labor Committee, the American Jewish Congress, the National Council of Jewish Women, Hadassah, the Workmen's Circle, and um, on and on, the culture clubs, the Jewish community centers, in English, Yiddish, and indeed at times in Hebrew, all recall the fate of the six million, contemplated the aftermath of the slaughter in ways that fit uh, who they were. They, con they constructed a repertoire of words and deeds which took as their inspiration the calamity of the six million. Some Jews, among these uh, five million or so American Jews in the post-war period, put words on paper conveying emotion, fact, and ideas through oratory and sermons, crafting liturgies for synagogues and homes, fashioning a vast, unorganized, spontaneous, one might even say chaotic project, which sought to keep alive the memory of uh, Europe's murders, murder Jews. Some American Jews on their own or under the aegis of uh, Jewish institutions chiseled references uh, to the catastrophe uh, onto stone. 
Other turn to music, recording, and performing an increasingly familiar repertoire of works which stood for the Holocaust. Those able to created dances, dramas, pageants, poetry, scholarly works, and graphic images, and organized public events. Again, so reminiscent of uh, what uh, um, we experienced tonight, uh, which took as their subject something about the Jews who had perished at the hands of the Nazis. Larger numbers watched, listened, and read uh, these uh, texts, their texts, thereby uh, making the catastrophe organic to American Jewish uh, public life. Now, much of what American Jews uh, did and said in the post-war period from the immediate end of the war into the uh, middle of the 1960s, much of what they did and said about the calamitous Hitler times went beyond the specifics of memorializing pure and simple. Rather, their memorial works, their memorial projects sprang from the specific political and communal concerns of uh, the years after the war. As shareholders in the largest, wealthiest, most unfettered, politically robust, and institutionally elaborate Jewish community in the world, they, and they alone, had to shoulder many practical tasks uh, beyond just remembering the victims, although remembering, they hoped, would help them uh, 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 take on uh, the burden which had fallen upon them in the wake of the calamity. They, and pretty much they alone, raised the money to aid the survivors in the immediate years after the war. Only American Jewry had the financial resources to support the remnant of European Jewry, known as the Sherita Pleita, the saving remnant. And in the years that the survivors needed assistance, vast sums flowed uh, for these projects from the United States. Uh, scholars estimate that the amount of uh, money collected by American Jews in the years from 1945, indeed 1944, uh, into the early 1950s is still the single largest philanthropic effort in all of human history. Never have so few, because we're talking about a relatively small co community, collected so much money in so short a period of time. And each project to aid the survivors, each fundraising effort demanded uh, that the organizers uh, tell and retell and tell again what had happened to the Jews of Europe and why this money uh, was uh, needed. Uh, the uh, um, uh, examples uh, were legion in the press, in uh, film, on radio programs, indeed television programs, uh, in the bulletins of organizations, uh, asking American Jews uh, to give, uh, to, give uh, to those um, uh, who had managed to survive. Uh, probably the most, uh, I think, uh, dramatic example of this uh, fundraising effort um, took place in just one example, in May of 1953, a television show that uh, many of us of a certain age remember called This Is Your Life uh, with Ralph Edwards um, featured a Holocaust survivor as the uh, um, subject of that night's uh, uh, show, a woman uh, by the name of Hannah Konar, a woman who had uh, been in Theresienstadt. Uh, she was a, a Czech Jew. And um, all of the proceeds, that uh, the money that would have been spent on advertising, Ralph Edwards announced, uh, were going to go to the United Jewish Appeal uh, to uh, aid uh, the uh, survivors uh, still languishing in um, displaced persons camps. So fundraising and political action for the survivors uh, required that the Holocaust uh, be remembered, that the Holocaust's events be retold, and they went hand in hand as American Jewry used its organs of public opinion, its communal agencies, and political capital to pick up the shattered pieces of Jewish life. The Jews of the United States, the nation which emerged from World War II as the West's unmatched economic and political power, furthermore spent much time and energy on making sure, not always successfully, uh, that the world remember that it was Germany that had perpetrated this crime against the Jewish people. American Jewish communal bodies, 
drew attention both to the evil deeds of the uh, German government and the Germans from 1933 to 1945 as they similarly monitored and protested informing the larger American public about the uh, re-entry of supposedly rehabilitated Nazis into public life in Germany. They play, paid close attention and warned American public officials about the resurgence of Nazism, of anti-Semitism uh, in uh, the new Germany. So uh, in 1955, as uh, again, one of many possible examples of this, Adolf Held, who was the chair of the Jewish Labor Committee, sent an impassioned letter to Secretary of State John Foster Dulles uh, protesting uh, the presence of vendors who, spo who sold, quote, outspoken uh, Nazi literature at the Frankfurt Book Fair. We are deeply shocked, wrote Held uh, to Dulles, quote, that our government did not publicly protest the fact that there are more than 20 West German publishing firms which issue almost exclusively memoirs of former leading Nazis, literature glorifying the barbarous, barbarous deeds of the Nazis. Now, Held uh, said very directly to uh, Dulles uh, that uh, uh, he, as a representative of an American Jewish organization, the Jewish Labor Committee, had the right to send him this letter and to issue this press release because he said, quote, the death stench of the six million Jews who perished in the concentration camp has not yet evaporated from the memories of those of us um, who uh, survived. Because American Jews engaged with the Holocaust in part to, so to advance uh, contemporary political goals, uh, they shared their memories of the Holocaust, of the catastrophe, with uh, the larger uh, public. Warsaw Ghetto Memorial Programs, again, uh, which echo in tonight's uh, um, uh, um, ceremony here, began as early as 1944. Uh, they were staged, they were held all over the country. Larger communities, uh, New York, Chicago, uh, had multiple Warsaw Ghetto Memorial Evenings all held on the same night competing with each other as to who could get the most uh, prestigious non-Jewish speaker. Uh, several, um, uh, New York had um, three of these different uh, Warsaw Ghetto Memorial programs and uh, the one which uh, secured uh, Eleanor Roosevelt to set up on the dais crowed uh, to the others, we got Eleanor Roosevelt. Roosevelt. Uh, the uh, program, uh, like the one we had tonight, had the El Molay Rachamim, the lighting of six candles by survivors, uh, a, usually a children's chorus uh, singing the Anima Amin um, and the Partisans Hymn, as well as a, uh, uh, um, a, a as well as uh, the Kaddish. Uh, they invited public officials mayors, members of the local uh, city council, governors, members of the judiciary uh, were invited to uh, sit in the audience or to sit on the dais and to hear what uh, local Jews had to say about uh, this uh, catastrophic event. So fundraising for survivors uh, became one vehicle, functioned as one vehicle through by which American Jews remembered and told about the Holocaust so to the effort to keep Germany's feet to the fire. In a much beyond that, as American Jews experienced the post-war period, they found ample opportunity and need to refer to and analogize about the European uh, catastrophe. They had much to say, for example, about the flowering of the American civil rights movement uh, in uh, that era, and that gave them an opportunity to keep the memory of the Holocaust alive and to revisit uh, the uh, catastrophe. Throughout their writings about the need for Jewish support for the civil rights effort, they repeatedly analogized between the condition of African Americans uh, and um, the uh, uh, tragic fate of Europe's uh, Jews. 
Uh, this uh, theme hi uh, ran through post-war discourse, but I think the uh, moment at which it got its greatest hearing, its broadest uh, articulation took place uh, on August 28th, uh, 1963, a day that uh, clearly is part of our uh, collective American um, uh, heritage, uh, the day of the Great March on Washington, in uh, which Martin Luther King gave his I Have a Dream speech. But we might also think of that day, um, August 28th, 1963, as the day when Rabbi Joachim Prince of uh, Newark, New Jersey, and the president of the American Jewish Congress gave his I Have a Nightmare speech. When I was the rabbi of the Jewish community in Berlin under the Hitler regime, said Prince, two speakers before Martin Luther King, I learned many things. The most important thing that I learned was that bigotry and hatred are not the most urgent problem, the most urgent problem, the most disgraceful, the most shameful, the most tragic is silence. And he went on to say his nightmare is that this will happen in the United States as well. So too nearly all the hot political issues of the day uh, in which American Jews stood on the liberal side of the equation uh, gave American Jews a chance to refer to and to repeat and to tell once again uh, in a shorter or longer form uh, what had happened uh, to the Jews of Europe as they faced uh, the uh, Nazi horde. I think perhaps uh, one of the most eloquent and uh, powerful of these uh, political events or political campaigns in which the Holocaust came to serve as American Jewry's uh, slogan and uh, uh, mantra was uh, the effort uh, to get the United States uh, Senate to pass uh, the Genocide Convention. So let me just pause and say something about the Genocide Convention. Um, it was a piece of uh, um, ultimately legislation, but it was a document written by a Polish Jewish jurist named Raphael Lemkin, who came to the United States in 1940. Uh, most of his family did not uh, make it to the United States and were slaughtered by uh, the uh, Germans. Uh, Lincoln, Lincoln um, uh, was almost Im immediately put on the payroll of the American Jewish Committee and uh, as he was investigated, investigating and trying to tell the larger world about the concept of genocide, indeed he coined the term genocide, uh, the American Jewish Committee uh, worked with him as he, Lemkin, introduced the Genocide Convention to the United Nations, which passed it in 1948, and the idea was that every government in the world, every country in the world, would ratify this treaty which declared genocide to be a crime. Okay. Uh, now, just as, parenthetically, the United States was one of the last countries to sign it. Okay, it did not sign it until 1986. But every time this treaty came up in front of the United States Senate, American Jewish organizations went into high gear to get the Senate to pass this uh, bill. So the first time it came up in 1950, Jacob Blaustein, president of the American Jewish Committee, testified in front of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee to uh, urge it to press the genesis, to, pre to, to, to press the, to, to pass this. In his words to the uh, Senate Committee, he combined Jewish politics, Jewish history, and larger concerns around the theme of the Holocaust. I am appearing on behalf of the American Jewish Committee we are concerned with genocide, not only because six million Jews were recently murdered, but because genocide is a crime against humanity which the civilized world must eradicate. The National Federation of Temple Sisterhoods in 1950, 1954, 1956, 1959, 1961, every time the Genocide Convention came up, sent uh, a barrage of letters to its members. Write your senators, urge the U.S. Senate to, Senate to ratify the convention, um, and its formal term was the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, who better than the Jew can understand the awful catastrophe which can result when any nation sets out on a path to wipe out whole communities and people? After viewing the ruins wrought by the Nazi Holocaust and will, the wholesale murder of six million Jews, we must press 
for the Genocide Convention. Okay. Uh, American Jewry uh, used the same kind of language, pressing Congress uh, for, uh, the, uh, cha for changes in the American immigration laws, uh, and uh, numerous other kinds of uh, liberal uh, measures uh, that uh, kept uh, uh, coming up to the American public and the American political bodies in the post-war period. But of all the issues that moved American Jewry in the period um, after the war as a vehicle to engage with the Holocaust, to refer to it, to think about it, probably none moved them more deeply than Israel. First, the struggle to create a sovereign Jewish state, and then efforts to gain support for, um, for it in the, uh, the United States. Uh, the uh, uh, words of American Jewelry, again, across the political spectrum, with nearly no exception, called for uh, the establishment of a Jewish uh, homeland in, uh, um, in Israel and uh, linked it uh, to the uh, so recent uh, devastation uh, that had engulfed um, the uh, Jewish people. Sharon Feynman, a young teenage girl in Indiana, uh, had said that at Camp Institute. And uh, I want to uh, pair her here with a very unlikely, um, uh, uh, shall we say, interlocutor, somebody who said the exact same thing she said, but in a very different way. And here I want to quote um, Isaac Lewin, a spokesman for American Orthodoxy, writing in uh, Yiddish in a uh, book that had been a series of articles entitled Nochen Chorben, or After the Destruction. He postulated uh, in this book that I'm sure Sharon Feynman didn't read since it was in Yiddish and I doubt she could have. Uh, she, he postulated how the emergence of Israel had made this Chorben okay, different from all the previous uh, Chorben, uh, Jewish destructions. This one both constituted, quote, the greatest destruction of Jewish history and it created the reality of Jewish sovereignty. So here's Lewin. When the mourning for the six million martyrs had, large, had hardly begun, the Jewish people have taken up a task for which there is no precedent to build their home in Israel. Without help from the outside, the old wandering nation has come back to its home. Lewin continued and noted that, quote, uh, the, that the wild beasts, meaning uh, the Nazis, did not leave behind even the smallest reminders of victims matters less now since the Jewish people can put up a memorial in their new home. Let the new settlements be named after the martyrs. Let the streets of Jerusalem, Tel Aviv, and Haifa, and all the other cities of Israel be memorial martyrs, m memorial markers for the ripped away sons and daughters of our people. Little of what American Jews did or said and produced about the Holocaust, whether remembering it for its own sake or deriving contemporary lessons from it, existed in a hermetically sealed Jewish world. When and where they could, they sought to share it with uh, references to it uh, with their uh, non-Jewish American neighbors. American Jews obviously had no uh, control over what the, um, uh, the others around them did with this material, and if the larger society did or did not, did or did not ignore, ignore them, uh, did not diminish the reality that in the production and dissemination of these texts, the Jews of the United States attempted to broadcast well beyond the boundaries of their community what the facts and meaning of the Holocaust. So I want us to listen briefly to a person who I'm sure none of us, uh, I, I in fact only found out about him because I found a little letter to the editor he wrote in an archive, but his name is Mr. H. Kudlowicz. I don't even know what the H st stands for. But he was the principal of a workman circle, an Arbiter Ring School, the I.L. Parrott School in Dorchester, Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Um, and um, he felt uh, obliged to speak out uh, about the matter of the Holocaust and Holocaust memorialization uh, to the local Boston press. So in 1959, he sent an, out an enraged letter to the editor of the Boston Globe, and fortunately, his letter got published, and that's how I was able to see it. And I want to quote his uh, brief words in full because they indicate not only American Jewry's widespread memorialization of the Holocaust, 
but the intensity of its interest in having the story told widely, broadly, and correctly. So there's gonna be a letter within a letter, and I'll use quote marks to indicate. So, to the editor, and this is Mr. Kudlowitz. I am writing to tell you of a drastic error uh, which appeared in the May 4 Globe in the article covering the Warsaw Ghetto Memorial. It was printed, now this is what was in the May 4 Globe. Children of the I.L. Parrots Arbiter Ring School lit the candles and later a reading, um, listen carefully, in German gave a portrayal of life in the ghetto and the massacre by the Nazis, end quote. Now, Mr. Kudlowitz, in the first place, your reporter should have inquired as to the language used if it was unfamiliar to him. In the second place, it should have been, it should have been apparent to the reporter that whatever language would have been used, it certainly would not have been German. This was a memorial observance paying tribute to the six million Jews who died at the hands of the German Nazis. Therefore, it would seem incongruous to sing the praises of the martyred Jews in the German language. The children of the I.L. Parrot School rendered their portrayal in Yiddish, the language used by the Jews in Eastern Europe, and taught at the school itself. Since the appearance of your article, our school has received numerous telephone calls questioning the use of German in the program, we would appreciate a retraction of your error. Okay, and I don't know if it ever got published. Okay, so American Jews clearly did not shrink from letting the non-Jewish public know about the Holocaust or how deeply it uh, moved them. After all, somebody from the school had to have informed the Globe about the upcoming memorial program uh, held in uh, this working class neighborhood in the first place. The catastrophe also came in the post-war period to serve a number of decidedly inner Jewish communal projects. Mr. Kudlowitz made that clear too. He had a Jewish public up in arms, thinking that the Jewish children in his school sent there to acquire Jewish knowledge and, to, and identity were learning German, the language of the perpetrator. perpetrators. So as post-war American Jews called for increased religious observance, enhanced Jewish education, a greater intensity of Jewish creativity and Jewish life, they foregrounded uh, the destruction of European Jewry. Those Jews communal leaders reminded the American Jewish public over and over and over again had been the pillars of authentic Judaism. Their communities had been the wellsprings of Jewish culture, the fountains of Jewish inspiration. With the destruction of European Jewry, however, American Jews now had to pick up where the martyrs had left off. Appeals to ordinary Jews to become more Jewish as a memorial to the six million in, on some level necessitated a creation of a new kind of Jewish history. The Jews murdered by the Nazis in the post-war American vision were uh, depicted as representing, representing piety, Jewish authenticity, traditionalism, uh, lived and exterminated in profoundly Jewish settings. It mattered little that in fact so many of the six million had been thoroughly modern people who, like American Jews themselves, had become secularized, that among the six million had been cosmopolitans who lived in cities, partook of 20th century culture, spoke the languages of the lands they lived in, articulated complicated and often tenuous connections to, the Jewish, to their Jewishness. In the post-war period, those who uh, had been slaughtered were described as having died al Kiddush Hashem for the sanctification of the name. They were martyrs who went to their deaths uh, in order uh, to preserve uh, their, um, their Jewishness uh, and um, in order to um, uh, uh, indeed hallow uh, God's uh, image. Well, uh, the... Uh, um, in, in this uh, uh, post-war American Jewish world, uh, many American Jews reminding, uh, uh, leaders of American Jews reminded uh, the rank and file uh, that those more pious Jews who had constituted the six million um, had to be now replaced by greater Jewish intensity in America. 
The Holocaust is su as such lent urgency to long heard exhortations hurled by American Jewish communal leaders at the rank and file to become more Jewish. Uh, it offered moral immediacy uh, to, a com to communal projects, both well uh, established as well as new undertakings. So uh, one example. The historian Simon Ravidovich delivered the inaugural lecture at the opening of Chicago's College of Jewish Studies in September 1948. He called upon his listeners, the students, faculty, notable guests, non-Jews among them, as well as the school's financial backers to remember that, quote, our brethren in the Polish ghettos under Hitler kept up tra the traditional idea of Jewish learning. Jewish learning. The way they learned, youth and aged, up to the last moments of their lives until they were thrown into the gas chambers will stand forever as one of the most glorious pages in our history. This should always be our, unfe our unforgettable lesson, a lesson for diaspora jewelry everywhere at all times. The implication could not have been clearer. If Jews could keep on studying Jewish texts in the death camps, then surely they could and they should do so in America. The catastrophe provided the leadership of American Jewry with a powerful tool as it went about trying to construct a self-sustaining, intense Jewish life in America. While those who invoked the Holocaust had to remind American Jews of their new role in the world, they differed radically as to what uh, that might mean. But yet, despite those differences, they shared a belief that the Holocaust made their project more compelling uh, than ever. Post-war American Jews who went about fashioning and participating in a commemorative culture based on the Holocaust did so from scratch. No obvious precedent guided them as they took their first steps towards creating new ceremonies, writing new liturgies, orchestrating pageants which took as their theme the horrendous stories of death and destruction, mass murders, gassings, and cremations. Nearly nothing of this sort existed in the general American culture with Amer which American Jews could adapt uh, for their own uses to mark their catastrophe. They could not look around them and see any other ethnic community which had presented itself to the larger society through a devastating tragedy, particularly one perpetrated on foreign soil. No minority group in America had yet created a museum, erected a massive monument on public space, organized university courses, or held a highly public uh, mourning ceremony open to all which focused on the painful events of their pasts. American Jews had to embark upon this on their own with no domestic partners as models. They also had few recent Jewish examples upon which they could rely as they went about step by step experimenting with new languages and genre to figure out what formulations worked best. Centuries had passed before, uh, uh, centuries had passed since Jewish prayer books had incorporated motifs of other Jewish suffering, other holocausts. When American Jews in the years following the Holocaust, the most recent Holocaust, rabbis and religious leaders discussed and argued how to make room for liturgical and calendrical innovations to, uh, uh, in, in the memory of the Hitler Holocaust. In doing so, they reflected the reality that no one could provide them an answer as to where and how to open the canon to put in this re the recent tragedy. They struggled among themselves how to consecrate a day of mourning for the Holocaust. Jewish holy days did not just get created de novo. American rabbis and interested lay people pondered the problem of authority and asked directly and indirectly if they had the right to expand the Jewish ritual calendar to set aside a time to remember uh, the six uh, million. Discussions about how to memorialize the Holocaust reflected the inner cleavages and pluralistic nature of Jewish life in America. Jewish life got lived out in thousands of local communities, each made up of mo multiple institutions divided by ideology, function, class, length of time in the United States. No national bodies directed the life of the group, 
and indeed uh, the utter disorganization of um, the American Jewish uh, people, its unwillingness to follow directions from any central agency provided one of the themes of American Jewish history. Yet each institution, each community, uh, each organization did what it did uh, in order to keep alive the memory of the Holocaust. So to draw this to an end in that anarchic environment, no one opposed recalling the victims of the uh, catastrophe. No one had any question about aiding the survivors or pointing out the evils of the perpetrators. Nor did they disagree among themselves with the basic premise that American Jewish communal institutions, schools for young children, through seminaries which trained rabbis, the Jewish press, and the multiplicity of organizations, philanthropic, political, cultural, religious, all had a share in remembering the six million and in using their memories to shape the post-war world. But since they had no guide to tell them how to do so, and no central authority which would tell them what to do, they all did it as they saw fit. So they had no idea what constituted the best memorial, but they all experimented in their own ways to find one and build it. Thank you. Okay, I I'm, I'm not sure of the time and... Uh, oh, we're good, we're good. Okay, so um, if there are questions... Uh, okay. Yes, we have some, uh, we have a little time for, uh, for some uh, questions for Professor Diner, uh, from what you just heard, anybody? That was an amazing uh, talk that you gave, thank you very much. Um, you described a period of, from 1950 to 1986, when the genocide bill did not pass in the United States, and you told us all the times when the American Jewish community tried to get it to pass. Mm -hmm. Can you say a little bit about what the counter arguments were that kept it from passing? Sure, okay, and uh, I should say that uh, Congressman Robert Kastenmeier, uh, no, I'm sorry, Senator William Proxmire from Wisconsin, was one of the leaders in the Senate trying to get it passed, and in his memoir he says, it was only the Jews who wanted it. <laughs> Okay, um, so the counter argument was first, Southern senators did not want it because they didn't want the possibility uh, that, so that somebody would start um, holding the United States responsible for uh, genocide in terms of uh, uh, slavery and the uh, extirpation of the uh, native population. So they did not want that. They were also concerned that by signing on to a um, international treaty, they were giving up some element of American sovereignty. Okay, and we, we've seen this actually in recent years where some political faction, okay, one political party, for example, <laughs> I'm not to be named, uh, you know, opposed, for example, the um, environmental standards of the Kyoto tra uh, um, Treaty because the United States doesn't take orders from uh, international agreements. So it was both um, a, I, I would say, a reactionary, primarily southern, uh, concern that uh, America would be held uh, uh, liable for acts of genocide at the same time that it was also uh, from a politically conservative element that did not want American uh, uh, autonomy to do what it wanted to do uh, um, in any way hampered by this international accord. Now it became very embarrassing when the Soviet Union signed it Okay, and uh, there the United States uh, was just not willing to do it for a long time. Um, during this period, 45 to 62, within the American Jewish community, was there any introspection or review of the American Jewish community's action or inaction before and during World War II? Okay, so that's a great question. Did everyone hear it? Okay, great. So, no. I mean, that is their narrative, and I think in some ways their narrative is historically much more accurate than the one we hear later. Okay, but their, uh, the story they told was, we did this, and we did that, and we tried this, and we tried that, and we failed. Okay, so they did not uh, take themselves to task 
for not having exerted uh, uh, the a adequate effort. What they said is what we did, we, we just failed at. Um, so uh, just as a very um, small example of that, you know, so 1954 was the um, 300th anniversary of Jewish life in, North Amer in, in the United States or in America. So there were a lot of books written about American Jewish history in 1954. And uh, one of them written for uh, high school age students has a chapter called American Jews to the Rescue. Okay, and what it talks about, you know, was the effort of the Joint and of Hyas and so on in the years from 1933 uh, onward, but ends with the, for all of our uh, efforts, um, our rescue uh, uh, was not up to uh, the enormity of the problem. Okay, it's going to be a later generation, particularly the one, I, I'd say, that comes of age in the late 60s, that starts to look back and say they didn't do anything. And as I said, I think the post-war narrative was actually a much more accurate one. Okay, now that we're actually you know, looking at the real documents, the real um, archival material. Thank you for that talk. As you pointed out, the Holocaust and memorializing the Holocaust has been a mainstay of Jewish life you know, in the second half of the 20th century. I wonder if you could um, sort of reflect or predict, uh, if that's mm. not too dangerous, how that will change as America and Judaism is moving into a much less clearly defined ethnic era. Okay, so that's a great question, and one no historian worth her or his salt would ever answer, because we know about the past, we, you know the future probably better than I do. Well, in a sense, um, if we uh, look at this post-war uh, memorialization, we can say that it was really different by 1964. It was very different than what it had been in 1945. And from 1964 onward, it starts becoming bigger and uh, more organized and obviously culminates in institutions like the Holocaust Museum. So it, like any cultural form, Holocaust memorialization evolved over time. And uh, you couldn't expect people in 1945 to say, let's have a, a big museum on the mall. I mean, it was just not possible. So therefore, your question is very apt. It clearly is not going to be what it is now, 20 years from now, 40 years from now. And um, my guess, okay, and I'm, I, I, don't hold me to it, probably won't be here in 40 years, um, that um, it will be much more in conversation with other um, groups that have gone through uh, their own um, genocidal um, experiences. And so uh, what was very striking in the period that I was looking at um, is there were, they didn't refer to the Armenians, for example. Okay, even though there are a number of Jewish communities that live cheek by jowl with Ar Armenian communities. And I saw no evidence. I actually tried to look for, you know, okay, were they ever trying to bring other ethnic communities uh, in with them and to memorialize together? And I saw no evidence of that. And my guess is we move into a more um, postmodern, multi-ethnic, and dare I say, multicultural world, um, the memory of the Holocaust will exist in the context of um, the experiences of other people who suffered because of who they were at the hands of some uh, racist uh, power. And I think we're going to hear the word racism much more to describe the Holocaust than we have heretofore, because it's a much more resonant word now that, and in the future than it was then. That, and that's my guess. Uh, we have another question for Professor Diner. Okay. Um, then thank you very my much, pleasure. Professor Diner. And there. Um, now, there should be, I hope, <laughs> there should be books out there uh, for Professor Diner to sign. And uh, the book should be with reverence and uh, mm -hmm. love. Uh, mm -hmm. We remember. Which I, yeah. Um, and um, so, and there's also, as I, as I mentioned earlier, there is a reception across uh, the hall to which all of you are also invited. Okay, thank you.